Our next speaker is uh, Stephen uh, Hattie, and he's coming to us from uh, USC, and he's the uh, fellowship director out there, and he's going to be talking about aortic stenosis today. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, join you this morning. So um, aortic stenosis is one of the most uh, common uh, valvular abnormalities we see, and particularly uh, in the U.S. It is, in general, um, it increases with the uh, patient age. The population is aging, so we're seeing more and more of this. It significantly, wow, these are different. Okay, it significantly impacts event-free survival. Uh, by the time you get to about uh, four meters per second or severe aortic stenosis, your uh, five-year event-free, three-year event-free survival is down to around 50%. And that sort of understates it because when we talk about the event, the event is very frequently sudden death. Uh, and that's, that's the slide illustrating this switch. Next. Okay. The location of the stenosis gives you a very good handle on what is causing the stenosis. As I said, uh, in the U.S., our major... Uh, our major cause is senile or calcific aortic stenosis, seen over here, where you have a large amount of calcium deposited in the uh, uh, leaflets and in the commissures. The pathology of this is very similar to uh, atherosclerotic disease. It begins usually with endothelial uh, damage and inflammation, followed by white cell infiltration, lipid deposition, and finally, calcium deposition, and this progresses at about 0.1 centimeters squared per year uh, once it gets started. Bicuspid disease is probably the most common congenital valvular disease seen way over here on the right. And um, this is about uh, 1 or 2% of the population. It's associated with other congenital abnormalities such as coarctation of the aorta, and mitral valve abnormalities. Patients who have uh, bicuspid or who have stenosis based on a bicuspid valve tend to have uh, a little bit higher incidence of post-stenotic dilatation than uh, patients who have it from other causes. These are the echo images or the echo views that we use to evaluate uh, aortic stenosis, the mid-esophageal short and long axis views we use primarily to look at the uh, valvular morphology and movement. The transgastric views we use to line up the Doppler probe where the Doppler cursor with the uh, flow to get our most accurate uh, velocity measurements. Uh, on the left, a normal aortic valve, left, non, and right coronary cusps visible, nice thin, uh, thin leaflets. Over on the right, not so much. Lots of calcium deposited. The leaflets uh, are, not, uh, are not moving very well, and I hope this moves, and it won't. All right, well, in any event, if you could see these moving, what you would see is over here on the right a very small, uh, uh, very small orifice in systole, and over here you would see a lot of turbulence in the left ventricular outflow tract. Oh, here we go. Great. No? And terrific. All right. And in 3D, basically the same thing. But this gives us the ability to get a little bit better handle on what exactly the pathology is and which leaflets uh, are or aren't involved. Bicuspid um, morphology depends primarily on which leaflets are fused and uh, any one of the three commissures can be, or any one of the three uh, uh, coaptations can be fused, or you can just have a straight up bileaflet valve. In any event, you end up with this sort of fish mouth appearance on the uh, valve, which is characteristic in systole of a, of a bicuspid valve. Uh, depending on which of the leaflets are fused together, this impacts which direction the jet is going to take as it comes through the aortic valve, and that ultimately changes the uh, configuration of the post-stenotic dilatation that you're going to see. 
unicuspid uh, aortic valves are very rare, but we, but we do see them. Uh, again, one uh, raphe down here and a uh, single orifice. Rheumatic disease also can affect the aortic valve. Uh, unlike mitral uh, rheumatic disease, the pathology proceeds from the uh, commissures inward, and you're said to be left with sort of a uh, triangular-shaped orifice at the end. Uh, echocardiographically, there's enough calcium and so forth laid down that really this is difficult to distinguish from plain old calcific aortic disease and we usually are going by the uh, uh, history of rheumatic fever or uh, involvement of other valves. Okay, uh, subvalvular location is also possible for our area of stenosis and these can be either fixed as in a uh, subaortic web or dynamic. Uh, in the case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or systolic anterior motion of the uh, mitral anterior leaflet. And here we have an image of a uh, subaortic web and you can see that the, you can see that the uh, membrane down here is clearly below the level of the annulus and if we had some color on you would definitely see turbulence in the area between this uh, uh, web and the annulus. Wow, okay. Uh, supervalvular uh, stenoses are really quite rare. Uh, the only one that's uh, really well, not even well described is Williams syndrome, which is a uh, uh, stenosis at the sinotubular junction, and it's so rare that I couldn't even find a decent picture of it. So we're gonna keep going. These are the criteria that we use to diagnose and grade aortic stenosis, the most common being uh, a uh, peak velocity of four meters per second, a mean gradient of 40 millimeters of mercury, and an indexed aortic valve area of 0 0.6 centimeters squared per meter squared. Depending on which of the measurements you're making and hanging your hat on for the diagnosis, these are going to be more or less uh, affected by the uh, transvalvular flow and uh, ejection fraction. Okay. Um, this is the uh, this is a uh, color flow Doppler uh, picture of the uh, aortic valve. This isn't the slide deck I gave you, is it? <laughs> okay. In any event, getting back to the uh, uh, flow dependence of the uh, uh, flow dependence of your measurements, uh, the very simplified Bernoulli equation measuring uh, the velocity and plugging it into 4v squared to get us the uh, peak instantaneous gradient is uh, probably the most dependent on flow. The continuity equation, which tells us that the area at one point times the velocity at that point has to equal the area at the second point downstream flow uh, times the velocity there. The Gorlin formula is what the cath, uh, uh, what's taken in the catheterization lab. Here they're actually measuring the pressures in the left ventricle and the aorta. However, they are estimating the cardiac output. So again, this also is fairly flow dependent. Less flow dependent are the uh, techniques of planimetry, either 2D or 3D by echo or MRI by CT. Here we see the, uh, here we see the maximum uh, peak instantaneous gradient being measured by color flow Doppler, uh, by uh, spectral Doppler. We put the Doppler thro probe through the aortic valve and measure the uh, velocity as it goes at velocity through the aortic valve during the cardiac cycle. Trace this out. The computer will give us the peak pressure and then integrate the area under the curve to give us the mean pressure. Illustration of the continuity equation. Once again, the area here in the LVOT times the velocity here 
has to equal the area here at the aortic valve times the velocity through the aortic valve. And this is an illustration of taking this measurement, Doppler probe through the aortic valve. This is the uh, trace through the aortic valve. This is the trace through the left ventricular outflow tract. We have the uh, uh, left ventricular outflow tract uh, area from another measurement. We have three of the uh, parameters, and we simply solve for the fourth. The numbers, or the measurements that we make in the cath lab, um, are uh, based on, me on measurements using uh, uh, high-fidelity uh, high catheters, actually measuring the pressure, whereas the pressure measurement or gradient we get in the echo lab is based on the peak instantaneous gradient. These events occur uh, at different points in the cardiac cycle, and therefore, and they're affected by different uh, physical laws. And so very frequently, there is not uh, complete agreement between these two measurements. And this can lead to some confusion uh, in determining whether or not, uh, in determining the degree of stenosis. Planimetry can be used, uh, as I said, here in 2D. Uh, get the image and trace this out. The computer will figure out the area for us. Or in 3D. 3D is more accurate because we can place our cursor plane exactly where we think the narrowest part of the aortic outflow is. Uh, gradient is dependent on valve area and flow. Flow is dependent on stroke volume and ejection fraction. Here I'm using ejection fraction, sort of a shorthand for a contractility or ventricular function. If you have um, a high stroke volume or high flow, um, this can be because of aortic regurgitation or a high output state, you're going to falsely elevate the gradient and therefore uh, overestimate the degree of aortic stenosis. Similarly, in a low stroke volume state, either because you have a very small patient, uh, mitral regurgitation, or perhaps a low EF, you're going to underestimate the gradient, and this will cause you to underestimate the degree of aortic stenosis. Great. Pathophysiologically, what we have is that the uh, increased uh, outflow tract obstruction leads to increased uh, wall stress and eventual left ventricular hypertrophy. As the hypertrophy develops, the ventricle becomes stiffer, develops less uh, uh, left ventricular end diastolic pressure increases, and subsequently pulmonary artery pressure will increase as well. Ultimately, as the ventricle fails, uh, you'll develop uh, eccentric hypertrophy as these compensation methods fail and the ventricle dilates. Following AVR, we expect to see some resolution of the uh, abnormalities, some reverse remodeling, but it's difficult, if not impossible, to predict exactly how much uh, reversal we're going to get. So what we're basically left with is a uh, ventricle like this, very hypertrophied, very uh, uh, hypercontractile. Okay, and the pathology, therefore, is going to dictate our anesthetic management. This is a very stiff, non-compliant ventricle. It's going to be very uh, sensitive to, after, uh, to preload reduction, whether that's caused by true volume status changes or whether the loading changes are due to arrhythmias uh, decreasing uh, mitral inflow. Similarly, uh, the very thick ventricle is going to uh, be sort of on the cusp of subendocardial ischemia and therefore is going to require uh, support for its perfusion pressure. Postoperatively, basically, all of this is going to stay the same. Uh, the ventricle, if anything, will be a little stiffer, having just been cardioplegic and ischemic, and so that uh, you're definitely going to have to have increased filling pressures in order to get the fiber stretch that you need. Um, in addition, you're going to also have to continue to maintain the perfusion pressure in order to prevent subendocardial ischemia. Bad things can happen during uh, even a 
routine aortic valve replacement, you might get some air or other debris down a coronary artery, a graft might go down, your button on your bentol uh, uh, repair might, uh, might kink, and you could, while most of our patients go out of the OR on beta blockers and vasodilators, uh, you could require some fairly significant uh, support. So approaching the patient with uh, a ugly looking uh, or possibly stenotic aortic valve, if you measure the gradient and, there, and you see a gradient, um, but the valve looks okay, basically you have to look elsewhere for the, for the source of the gradient and that is most likely going to be subvalvular. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, if, you, if the gradient is severe, and the aortic valve area measures out to be small, you probably have aortic stenosis, patient needs valve replacement. If the gradient is severe, but you have reason to think that the aortic valve area is not decreased, for example, if you just put in a perfectly good bioprosthetic valve, then uh, you probably have a high flow state. If the valve looks bad, but the gradient is not increased, then the degree of ventricular dysfunction or lack thereof is going to determine whether or not you have, uh, probably have pseudo, um, uh, pseudo AS or uh, a low flow state. These are the criteria for replacing, or currently the criteria for replacing a valve. Basically, it's anybody with severe AS or moderate AS that's having another uh, cardiac surgery. As I said before, uh, TAVR has sort of changed the landscape in aortic stenosis, and while at the extremes, either uh, very reasonably good uh, surgical risk or very bad surgical risk, things have stayed the same. However, uh, for intermediate surgical risks, what we see is as we gain more and more experience with TAVR um, and the long-term outcomes are favorable, uh, TAVR is becoming uh, indicated for uh, patients with uh, fewer comorbidities and uh, lower surgical risk. Mm. Okay, post bypass and post post uh, TAVR, we need to evaluate the uh, uh, any residual aortic regurgitation. This is very important, particularly in TAVR, since it uh, impacts uh, since residual AR impacts. Um, uh, long-term uh, mortality fairly significantly. Thank you. That's all I have. Sorry. Thank you.